related than Rust related. So it's going to be about organizing your projects. Uh, what's a package? What's a create? What's a module? Uh, we're going to do Rust as well, since modules are part of the Rust language, whereas crates and packages are more tightly related to how Cargo builds the project. Um, so uh, I don't know if you discussed Cargo much, but, uh, but basically it's uh, it's uh, sort of your tool chain organizer that will take care of uh, dependencies for you, building... Uh, so it's not quite like CMake in C++ because CMake just generates build files if you use it. Uh, Cargo does dependency management and all of that as well. So it's a really powerful tool for uh, organizing your projects and it's very, uh, it's tightly bound with Rust. So, um, so you should use it instead of doing it without if you even can do that. So let's have an overview of what we're gonna do today. So we're going to look at uh, packages, creates, modules, uh, convention over configuration, which is uh, just a, a section of uh, quick tips that's related to Cargo and how you use it, and some other Cargo features if time allows it, <clears throat> which I think it should. Um, so this is less technical than uh, uh, pure coding lectures, but... Uh, it's uh, just as important because this is going to enable you to be efficient in managing projects of at least small to medium scale. Uh, you're going to have tools that allow you to write technically small libraries that other people can use without giving them too much code. So you can restrict visibility. That's what modules are for. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so let's just start at the top. Um, I just finished. Uh, what we're going to start off with Cargo, but we're going to go, so we're technically we're going into uh, the concept of a package. Um, so a package is a collection of source files and the cargo.toml, which is a manifest file that describes the package. And it has a name and a version that's used for specifying dependencies between packages. So for example, one package can depend on uh, another one, and it can depend on, for example, version 0.2.0 of the other package. So, and the way this looks, uh, the first part of the cargo toml file is like this. It defines a package, which has a name that should be snake case. Uh, you should not have capital letters here. It should basically be snake case, which is underscores between words and all, everything's lowercase. Um, it will actually, you will actually get a compile warning if you don't do it. Uh, and then you have a version which by default uses semantic versioning that basically means this is a major version, this is a minor version, and this is a patch version. And uh, uh, but I think uh, as long that's I think you while you code you don't necessarily have to do minor version being not API breaking and one uh, the major one being API breaking. Uh, of course, if you're making a game that doesn't really matter, then you can just do it based on the feature set, but at least it's designed to work around semantic versioning. So there's no reason not to follow that convention. If you if you're writing for especially a library that other people are going to use, then you should probably follow the convention. Uh, what's nice about that is uh, when you define dependencies for your packages, you can say that I depend on version one point anything. So you don't care as long as the major version is one. You could say 0 0.2 point and then not specify the patch, in which, in which case it will, in all cases, uh, use the minor version. And then as patches arrive, uh, it will just update to that when you tell it to do so. So it's uh, it's got pros and cons, but uh, overall, that's, that's at least what it's based on. And then you have uh, authors, which is name and email, and you can that's a list, basically. So if multiple people contribute, you just comma separate it, and it's going to know, you're going to know who to um, I probably should take this out of the recording, actually, when I think about it. But. And then the addition is just sort of like a milestone in terms of feature sets. I will blur it. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't think very far. Uh, yeah. So, and the latest edition is currently 2018. It's like a milestone. And the previous one before that was 2015. So... Uh, it doesn't limit to the features you can use after 2018. It's just like a milestone. You need at least this. 
uh, and the package root is the directory where your cargo.toml manifest is located. So, and that's uh, basically the underneath your uh, root folder, you have cargo.toml and then you have the rest of the project files in there. There's also the concept of workspaces for very large projects, if in case you need multiple packages, which will not be your student projects and assignments. And a workspace is a collection of one or more packages and they share a common dependency resolution with a shared cargo lock file. And they have a shared output directory and various settings, such as, for example, build profiles. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that at all today. Uh, that's beyond today. And a package can consist of one or more crates, uh, which you can think of as build targets in C and C++, for example, with CMake, where you create, can create executables and libraries. So that's sort of the parallel, if you're familiar. If you're not familiar, then it really the comparison won't make much sense. But we're going to talk about crates in the context of Rust after. And a crate can be organized with modules, which will um, affect visibility of code to other users of that code. And uh, a, a package also has a section on dependencies. So you have, uh, they're de defined in the at the package level in cargo.toml. So you don't generally de de declare dependencies at a, a crate level, um, although I think you can if you absolutely want to. Uh, and by default, the REST repository for crates is for a pack that you can depend on, uh, is fetched from crates.io, but you can also use GitHub as a source. So in the cargo.toml file, that will be located under the dependencies section. And uh, if you want to go from GitHub, then you just go dependency, you give it a name, bracket lib equals, and then you say git, and you just paste the link to the Git repo. And I think this one has to have a cargo.toml and or some definition of a Rust project that uh, cargo will recognize. Or if you just want to source it from the basic crate repository, then you just say the crate name and the version. You don't have to specify all three. You can just specify the first one, the second one, and or all three if you would need a specific version. Uh, if you don't specify the last one, as I said, then it will just take the latest that is 0 0.8 point latest and uh, only updated it to update it once you tell it to. Um, so, and we're going to come back to this, but this is just like a brief overview of what you can put uh, in the in the package. So you have the lock file, the tunnel file, then you have your source. You can have benchmarks, examples, and tests, which are integration tests, but we will look at that. Again, uh, one thing I should also mention here is that uh, in addition to the cargo.toml file, you also have a cargo.lock file, which you should not git ignore. Uh, that should also be committed, even though it's automatically created from uh, uh, as you update. Basically, what that does is it when you build your projects without the lock file or when it's clean, then it will lock in the versions. So if you have RAN 0.8.3, it will lock that version. And then if you later change this to point 0.9, then you have to tell it to update the lock file, uh, which will then update the lock file to also lock itself to that version. But especially if you use just 0 0.8 here, then it's going to pull the latest, which might be 0.83 at the time, which will be in the lock file. And then say someday later, it uh, releases 0 0.8.5 instead of 0.3. When you build your project, Rust will not automatically use 0.5 unless you tell it to update, in which case a lock file gets updated to the new version. Uh, and you will use the latest uh, version again. Uh, the benefit of this is that uh, when you push and pull code between different computers uh, with the lock file included, uh, then other people is, are pretty much guaranteed that their code will build if they use the same lock file and it will function the same because they're using exactly the same library versions for, from the dependencies and it will not have updated on their machine because they haven't hadn't built yet. So you should commit the, both the toml and the lock file when your projects. And then you can run uh, the command is cargo update, which will then update the lock file and update the libraries to the latest version based on whatever you put in the dependencies. If you have 0.83 here, it will not update because there is no 
you hard coded the version exactly. Uh, yeah, so to get started, um, we can use cargo new and a package name with snake case to create a new project. This will create some of the basic folders and files for us. Uh, cargo build, once you're in the package directory, can build it and run will run it, but also build it, builds it if it's not already built. So let's just go. Let's go here and we can go cargo new. Let's call it taxi, taxi code. And then it creates a folder. If you go into the folder, uh, it's, I don't know if this text is too small. Also, the chat, yeah. But probably I can see. Yeah, and in here we get our tunnel file and we get a source directory which has the main file that just prints hello world. So that's the default cargo project. And if we look at the cargo file, it has package text underscore code version. Yeah, okay. Oops. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's move on. So yeah, uh, but basically that's it. But we already have a project, so I'm not going to use the taxi project for now. Uh, but first, we're going to move on to crates. Uh, Rust create is either a library or an executable program, referred to as either a library create or a binary create, respectively. So, a create. Uh, if you're familiar with C++, it could be a target. So it could be a, a library build target or a executable target that becomes an, on Windows an .exe file uh, or uh, basically an executable binary. So, or it could be a, a library. So it's sort of the same, except it's called a crate. So it's basically a separate unit of compilation that becomes uh, an output file, either a binary library or a binary uh, executable which is a library or a binary crate. Essentially, if you compare it to CMake, it's a build target. If you don't haven't used it, then don't worry about it. And it's the main file that gets compiled into a binary, so it can be an executable or a library. And the source code for any given crate can be subdivided into modules. And now let's have a quick look at a module before we go into some code examples and try to make something. Uh, in short, modules uh, can be used to organize your code into logical units, and they can provide uh, isolated namespaces where you can control the visibility of types, code, functions, uh, and other definitions. And it's uh, so a create can then be divided into uh, many modules, as many as you like, technically. And uh, you don't need uh, new files to create new modules. And you also don't need to say anything in cargo about modules because that's entirely within the Rust, uh, Rust language. And it's usually done to organize your code uh, to relate functionality. For example, if you're making maybe a game, you can have rendering, you can have audio, and then you can have the create, which is the executable, uses these uh, modules to uh, tie it all together into the final game or your final uh, tic-tac-toe or anything if uh, you're going to do that in Rust. Uh, yeah, so structs, functions, and anything can be uh, public or private in this context of a module. Uh, a module is either used uh, and declared with the mod keyword, or you can use the file hierarchy to create modules at the file scope. For example, if you create a source and then a folder module name, with mod.rs, then you're, you have created a module with oops, with this name that's called module name. Or you can just create source module name.rs, which is just a file with that name that becomes a module of this name. So basically, any file you create that does not follow either uh, one of the base conventions that is main.rs, which is uh, your main binary executable or lib.rs, which is going to become your library, uh, will create an implicit module based on the file name. You can also create multiple modules inside of each file, uh, which we will look at. And that, that's when you use the mod keyword. Uh, and in terms of visibility, 
uh, modules limit visibility by default. So that means everything in a module by default is private. Nobody else except uh, those inside of the module can use it. You can expose types, but uh, that's opt-in rather than opt-out. So basically, it's the same as this, uh, that everything is private by default. If you want to make something visible to users of a module, you must make it pub with the pub keyboard uh, keyword, which is short for public. And you can have as many sub modules or within another module uh, as you want. And each child module has access to everything in the parent and in the parent's parent, regardless if it's public or not. But parent modules can access only all the public items of their direct children, regardless if they are uh, have our public module or not. So all of this will become more clear as we just look at a simple example to explain all of this further. Um, yeah, so are there any questions before we look at the code or maybe we should just jump to the code and um, you can ask questions after you see some examples of using this. Okay, so I think we're just going to uh, jump into uh, the code in that case. So let's actually, so here is a project that's basically just been created with, uh, with Cargo New. Uh, I called it, oh God. Sorry, Marius. <laughs> oh, no worries, I will find it and blur it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I won't open this file any, anymore. And let, or maybe I can just change it and then you don't have to do it any further. It's probably best to just do it one more time. This is a disabled email. It doesn't work anymore. So but uh, so that's fine. And now you, can, now you don't have to worry anymore. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so it's got the basic package. Uh, Tomal file, we call it packaging. Uh, I'm actually going to call it taxi ride, even though the folder is called packaging, since that's what we're going to use as an example. And this will be the name of uh, your output executable once you build the project. It will also be the name of your library if you create a library create in this project as well. So say we wanted to have a project program that um, taxi drivers use in their cabs to compute uh, how expensive a trip is going to be. So what we could do is simply uh, create a function, compute fare that takes a rate uh, per kilometer, uh, maybe a and maybe a distance. So let's let's uh, and it returns a amount of money, and we basically just go rate times distance, and there's a starting fee of hundred that's uh, locked. What we could say is we just print the fare, uh, the taxi costs not compute fare, 35.4, and you took the taxi for 11 kilometers, 11.2. Then if we run it with cargo run, we say that, okay, it costs that much. However, we don't, uh, since this is going to be a big uh, taxi computing program, uh, we want to move we want to move this code into separate uh, modules. So we're going to do that a couple of different ways um, to just highlight everything we've been talking about. So to start with, we're going to just create a new Rust file that we're going to call, for example, taxi.rs. And we're going to copy paste this in here and save it. Now we see uh, the ID actually complains that the file is not included in the module tree analysis is not available. Um, what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means this file, taxi.rs, is completely separate from what Cargo can read as part of the project. Since, uh, oh, this is actually being the source folder. Points still the same. Uh, since we have main, which is understood by Cargo as this is a binary crate, it's going to be your main executable. So I know this. 
We also have could have had lib.rs, which it understands as this is the default library create. I understand this. Uh, but taxi.rs has no convention. It's just our code. And nobody knows that this is anything. So to get this into the main file and be able to use it, we have to declare that there's a module called taxi and we're using it in this crate. So, so now we can now we have access to taxi and we can go instead of saying compute fair, we will go taxi compute fair. However, um, this file is this is not public. It exists, but we can't use it because it has not been exposed within the module that's taxi. Uh, so by creating this file, we implicitly created a module named taxi. And that, so we can't use this without saying it's a public function. So we have the public function compute fair now, does exactly the same. And now we have access to it by using going taxi and then looking through the scope, we find compute fair in there. Except it won't actually complete unless I'm in a valid area. So yeah, now it's there. Uh, that's great. Uh, we can now do our program and see that it does exactly the same, except now we have a taxi module where we can put taxi related functions. Um, however, uh, somebody figured out that uh, we're going to need more than just taxis. We're going to need to store trips and have databases. And uh, we don't want to just have a lot of cluttered files here. So let's, so somebody decided to group everything. Um, I, the IDE says new package, but it's not actually a package in the sense of Rust. It's just a folder. So we're going to call this fair because it's about computing the taxi fair. And in here, we're going to create a file that's called mod.rs. So by doing that, we now have created a module that's called fair. Mod.rs is recognized. Uh, by cargo, so the like anything we put in here will not get a new module name. That's so it's, we don't have to do fair colon colon mod colon colon anything. This is just the same as uh, uh, as doing this basically by having a folder called taxi and then mod.rs within that. Except this module scope here, we can just add multiple files to it to automatically get it scoped to the same module. But first, we're going to just create a function here as well. Let's remember to make it public. Public function compute fair. Oops, compute fair. And we're going to say distance and rate. And it returns an F32. And we do the same thing, except here the price is locked to 50. And remember, we don't have to say return since it's uh, the last expression of the function. and uh, this is an expression. So it basically automatically goes to the return value. Um, however, it's the same thing. It's not included in the module tree. Uh, so let's do that as well. Let's say we have also a mod there. Uh, now that's not a problem anymore. And we can say that the other taxi, and then we're going to use the other function, which is fair compute fair. Now, as you noticed, maybe um, I sw swapped the parameters here. So here, actually, the distance is the first and the rate is the second. So say they drove 11.2 and they had a rate of 30.4. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, also multiplication, which uh, would have made the ride excessively expensive. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for the catch. So yeah, uh, yeah, but we also want to actually only have two uh, decimals, so we just add the format specifier for point two. Yeah, so uh, great question. Uh, that's what that's going to be. That's actually the next thing we're going to look at. So, uh, um, but from what I understand, I can just answer it now. From what I understand, uh, when you have multiple files in here, uh, you can use, you generally can use the mod.rs to collect everything into the same scope. That way, you don't have to expose all the sub other things for the user. Uh, so, 
I'm going to do a, uh, an example now. So say we have a, another file that's related to fair that's going to be called trips.rs. So it's not currently not included in the module tree. Same thing, except we can't go to main now and say, uh, oh, fair trips. Oops, that's, that's not going to work. So we cannot declare it here anymore. However, in mod, we can now say that we have trips is a part of fair. So now, again, we could think that we could go um, fair trips, uh, but we can't. And that's because we have to say this is also public for every, everyone who uses the fair module can also use fair trips. Um, so let's just create a quick function here. We're going to call make let's make it public too. We're going to call it save trip price uh, float and maybe a customer string. And it's just going to go save, save at no, to the database. We actually won't do it, but so we just say, hey, we save this trip to the database. Uh, and since this is now public, we have it exposed through the fair module. We can now say fair trips, save trip. 100, and we had Bob, Bobby riding the taxi. Uh, however, maybe it's to the user, they don't really care whether something is a trip or a fair. Uh, that's just for us as a developer to organize say now we have fair, we have trips, we just do that for ourselves so we can organize all trip related code in here, but maybe users of our module, they don't actually uh, care about that. So this is where um, the folder structure actually is quite beneficial because now you can say, we just want to have mod trips. We want to use it, but we don't want to expose it. And then we can instead say that for everybody else, we will just say, uh, we will just use trips save trip publicly in the this module so for anyone who uses the module they just have to go fair save trip they don't have to care about it that it's implemented in another file or another module they can just use use it as a part of uh, the natural flow like uh, for example so now they can just use it there. So we can use this to, um, if you use other libraries, you may <clears throat> may notice that they have something called uh, a prelude, which is like uh, what you include to get all the basic building blocks of the library that you might need. Um, and that's something you can put in here and expose it like that. Uh, but I will get back to this. So for now, I'm just gonna make it a public module trips. But the idea is you can you can just implement things in separate uh, files or modules. And then in the mod.rs, you can expose it under a different name, under a different scope. Uh, you can pre-populate, for example, you can create you can create a module called prelude in here that is public. And in here, you can publicly expose trips. Um, oops, that's so. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything in here. Same trip. So if we created a function here that's uh, initialize, then say trip. And you can expose this in here. So then users of your library, they can just um, say they want to use fair prelude and star. And then you can expose in this uh, module, you can expose, here's everything I think you should have if you want to just get started with the library and uh, don't care about polluting your namespace. So a lot of libraries use this convention. It's in the standard library as well. Uh, that's the reason you can just go vec. Um, I32. Uh, you don't have to import VEC because VEC is by default imported by Rust in its prelude. Um, so uh, same with string. You don't have to actually import string to use it. 
uh, it's implicitly imported for you. But a lot of libraries also use this concept so that you can import anything that's important to use the library, given that you don't care about uh, polluting uh, your namespace with different names. So, and that way you can also make this private. And now everything can be private in here except this module, which exposes everything. So, so you can or you can do that. Uh, but yeah. For now, we're gonna just leave it at this being public and trips having this public thing. And you have compute fair, so just compute fair or taxi ride. Um, just one two. And now it's, did I forget to make it public again? Yeah, so now we have two functions that have the same name in two different namespaces. Uh, we're going to create one more. So let's create a new Rust file. And this time we're gonna call it lib.rs. Now lib.rs is actually a recognized file name. It's going to uh, create a library create. So by adding this file, we have now introduced a new create to our project. That is the library. Uh, main is going to compile to an executable and library is going to compile to a library depending on your platform. So if we just go cargo build and we go to here, uh, we can see that we get now we have multiple, we have taxi rad, which is our executable. So that's main.rs is a create, it's a binary create and it became taxi ride which means if we run taxi ride, we run our program. Now, as soon as we added lib, we get a new thing in here. We get lib taxi ride.d. So on Mac, this is gonna be a different uh, extension uh, because it uses a different binary format on Windows, it's gonna be different, but in the end, it's gonna be a library that the platform you compile on or for uh, is gonna understand. So it could be maybe a DLL or a dot lib on Windows. Uh, on Linux, it could also be a, probably a dot so file. Uh, but yeah, the point is that uh, as soon as we added lib, we create a new crate, not the module. And we get to see that because it outputs a new file, which is the lib taxi ride that contains all the functions that are built in here. Currently it's empty, but at least I just want to highlight that this the create produces something on your file system when you build. So in here we're going to create another function called compute fair. We're going to say distance. Uh, we're going to call rate. But in this library we're also going to introduce something new. We're going to call an enum driving style. So we're going to do slow uh, limit fast jail actually this yeah so you can ask your driver to follow one of these driving styles so style driving style and it produces the same so you can ask your driver to go slow follow the speed limits go a little bit fast or drive in a way that makes him go to jail if he's caught and essentially it's the same thing so we want to have our base p is the distance times the rate plus 100. And then we want to return just base multiplied by matching the style. Slow, it's 0.5, limit is 1, pass this 1.3, and jail is 3.9. So essentially, the faster you go, the more expensive your ride's going to be. Uh, if we try to run the program right now, uh, let's see, cargo run. We see not what I expected, but that's fine. Probably because we need to use it. Uh, so uh, now, however, it's worth noting that we should no longer go modlib because this is now a library crate. 
so now instead we have to we have to use it. So we have use taxi ride should be. Um, the best way to find out is actually just to try to use compute fare. Actually, we need to make it. Um, Use taxi right. We have to make it public. Yes, we do. That's why I didn't get what I was expecting. Yeah, so this is what I was expecting um, an error. Uh, that's because it now complains that uh, we are leaking a private type, uh, which is driving style. This function is public, uh, and we want a parameter that is an enum called driving style. Uh, which is a private type. So we can't actually expose this interface to users of this code. So what we actually have to do is say that the enum is also public. Otherwise we can't allow users of the code to use this function. And then if we build it, then we, it should work. Except, uh, yeah, except I didn't finish this. So uh, now since this is a library, we can just use it directly. So, if we look at the TOML file, we see the name of this package is taxi ride, and the name of the library also becomes that. As you saw in the file system, it was called lib taxi ride. So to use anything from our library create, we have to go use taxi ride, and then we can just use anything that's public. So we can use compare compute fair if we wanted to. That way, if we just use it straight up, or we cannot do any of that and just say that uh, the Fast taxi costs, uh, and instead of using fare, we would just use taxi ride compute fare and also pass taxi ride driving style jail. And we say that uh, if you want to drive that fast, the taxi is going to cost you 1,700. Uh, so However, uh, at some point, it's going to be a bit tedious to start writing out taxi colon colon, taxi ride colon colon, especially for every type. So that's where the use keyword that we uh, ended up using a bit earlier actually um, uh, comes in. So we can say that we want to use taxi ride. At the very least, we want to use the enum so we don't have to do this. And then we can get rid of the qualifier or we can keep it because both the absolute path and the relative one is, are both still valid. But in this case, we want to use the relative one. Uh, often uh, what you will see is that people will import types such as enums and structs, but they will not do it for functions. Um, although for a small example like this, we can just do compute fair as well. Uh, and then that's going to work and we can get rid of that too. Um, although at this point, you may have noticed something that can go bad if you start importing functions from everywhere. Say we also did want to write taxi and fare. We wanted to use taxi, compute fare, and we wanted to use fare, compute fare. Um, if we then start to call all of this stuff, um, we would not actually have a functioning program because um, we are now importing three of the same names to the same scope. And that's not allowed. So um, normally uh, it's best to not import too much. And for short names such as taxi and fare, it's not that really a big deal to just do this. However, for types and enums, it's often more useful to do it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with really uh, long uh, lines. At least from um, what's normal, it's uh, more normal to import types than it is to import functions. But you can, of course, do it. It's uh, not very often that you have three compute fair functions after all, but having other things such as print error or log error or min or max, things like that can often clash more easily. And it's also worth noting that if we wanted to, we couldn't actually have you said use taxi compute fair 
uh, without saying that, hey, we, this is a module that we're going to use. And the order doesn't matter. So you can, as long as you have said that mod text is a thing, you can put the use statement above, below, wherever you like. And then when we run it, we get back to what we had before. Uh, so let's add another concept. Um, say mm, we wanted this stuff to be somewhere else. So we didn't want to do the match statement here. We want to have a separate function for it. So we have to, we have a function that is map style to price multiply, which takes a style, that's a driving style, and returns a multiplier. So we want just that, and we don't want it to be public because we don't want anyone else to be able to use it. So we don't want to be able to go taxi ride and say map that because users of the code won't care how we map it unless they're going to configure it, but that's beyond today. So, uh, However, to prove the next point uh, that we talked about in the slides, let's create a separate module in here that we call um, implementation detail or just detail for short. Now you don't actually have to do this at all because it's already private so nobody cares but this is just to highlight the visibility rules. So now suddenly we don't know what driving style is anymore because we are now in the scope of this module which is not uh, which has no concept of driving style because that's declared in this one in the root here of this library. Uh, and since this is lib, it doesn't actually declare a module that we talked about, it, that this is not called uh, mod lib. Um, so what we can do, we can either do an absolute path, so we can say create driving style. Create is the root of any create, so in this case, the library create. In main, uh, create would refer to the main create, which also has access to this now because we're using it. So if you wanted, you could prefix absolutely everything uh, with create before calling it as soon as it's as long as it's in the scope of your create. But that's stupid. It's, at least it's very verbose. Uh, so we can do that, or since we can use a relative path, since we are inside the detail mod, and this is in the parent module, we have access to it. So we can go through super and say super driving style. So super is your parent module. So you go up one step in the module hierarchy and then you get to driving style. If we want to do, I think we could also be crazy and go self super detail super. Okay, yeah, that's a bit stupid. Yeah, but we could actually go self super detail. So self is this module and then the super of this module and then detail. So you, if you want to be, you can be verbose without it actually helping you. But the point is actually that the keyword self refers to the current this module, super is the parent module. And as, as we said, uh, submodules can have access to everything in the parent. So even if we create a, a, another function here that is log message, that just takes a message, goes print line log. Let's also fix it for the rest, but we don't actually want to prefix this. We just want to use driving style. So we're just gonna use super driving style. That way we can just use it in here. So this module now uses uh, this from the parent module, which means we don't have to specify the parent module every time. Uh, we also have a private function log message in the parent now. Uh, we can also, we can now call uh, log message which also imports it. So this imports it actually from the top down, so from create to log message, whereas this imports it from the bottom up, so super, so one step up to driving style. And then we can say, I map some styles now. And that's gonna work just fine because um, this is private in the parent, but all child modules can access their parents' privates. That sounds too bad. <laughs> Oops. Um, yeah, well, uh, all modules can access their parent, the private members, private data of the parents. 
whether that be a type or a function. Um, however, um, the other way around, so we now have compute fair. What if we want to do call, we are going to call map style to price multiplier instead of this. Uh, we don't have, okay, so we need to, okay, so say, oh, we need to use detail. Yeah, that works. Oh, but we can't use it. So what we did, did we say about that? Parent modules can access all public items in their direct child or children, regardless if the module is public. So currently this module is not public and this function is not public. If we made this public, we cannot access the function. But now everybody who uses the library can access the details. So now we can go, oh, taxi ride. Uh, detail, yay, I can, I can access this now, but I, don't, I shouldn't have access to that. So we definitely don't want to make the module public because that's just for the library. But we can make this function public, which will now allow us to use it. And we're going to pass the style. Uh, so parents can just access this guy's public uh, functions or types, but nobody else can access it because the module is not public. Uh, we can also create another module in here, which we're going to call super detail. That's going to print. Uh, it's going to print super detail. Uh, actually, that's not how it works. Uh, we need a function. Super print. Me. Um, and we're going to make this public. So in the parent now, we could think that we could just go, OK, so detail super detail print me before here. Uh, but that's not going to work because this module is private inside of this module and the parent can only access its direct children. So that's a direct module with public things. So you can take all of these public things, even this if this is private, but you cannot access this child's uh, inner modules that are not public. So this one could say super detail. No, I could say super details print me. And that would be okay. Now you see it prints all of that. Um, all right, steal from paint. Just to make sure it still compiles. Uh, However, if we did make this public, then the parent could also access it. So then we can go through detail, super detail, and print me. And that would be fine. And super detail can, instead of just print line, we could use log message, which is from uh, the parents. Parent. So this is detail, and then we go here, because the children still have access to everything that the parents. So the children can basically go through every chain of parents, and then grandparents, and whatever. And the, uh, access everything, even if it's private. So here again, it goes from the top down, but we could also go super, super log message if we want to go from the bottom up and do the same import. Uh, we could also not use it and just prefix it like that. So the use keyword basically brings something into scope through an absolute or relative path from the top, from the bottom, as long as you navigate the correct path. Uh, and you have access to it through uh, public and private stuff. So there's that. So that's that's our detail. Uh, finally, we want to instead of we want to do one more where we don't take three parameters. We want to have a struct called fair parameters or something like that. That holds a distance, rate, and a style. And this struct is what we, we just want this one instead. So we just want a params and we want that to be a reference to fair parameters. And then we're just gonna go params.distance rate and dot start. So now we have a struct. Yeah, we cannot move it. So now this one has to be a reference. I want to take a reference. 
because we don't want to move it out because this one is not copied, but actually we, we don't, it's just an enum. So we actually going to just make sure we derive from copy flow and then it's fine. Mm, yeah, so now it's essentially the same, except we take a struct as a parameter. If we try to build now, we are again leaking a private type. We are leaking this struct. So we're gonna make it public. Cool. Now we need to update the call sites because now we're calling it without the struct. So we want to create it with the struct. So let's create a struct. Let's create fair parameters. And we want to import it since it's a type, that's fine. Equals fair parameters. And let's set the rates to 12. Let's set the distance to 34.6. And let's set the style to driving style fast this time. Uh, all of this is red. Um, it says they're all private. So that's an important thing to remember when you submit, make a struct public, all the, the struct, the type becomes public, but all the fields are by default private. So if you want distance to be able to be accessed from the outside, you have to say public for every single field of the struct. So in C++, if you've done this, this is basically like having a struct, say, fair. And then you have a private section and a public section, except here you prefix the members. Uh, but but uh, yeah, you can also uh, do this. But in this case, we actually, so now this is allowed. And we can, again, call this by passing in a reference to fair parameters. And we get the same thing. Uh, however, we actually don't want to expose this because we don't want users to change it later. So let's get rid of all of this. And instead say we want to implement fair parameters. And we want to create a public function. It's called new that takes a distance rate style and produces self and self in this context is the type fair parameters so it it returns its own type but we could also say this and it's the same thing and here we just want to say okay uh what we're basically just going to return this guy with this rate style so now we basically create a constructor that users can use. So this guy can now say new. And we can pass 12 kilometers, 36.2. And we want to have driving style slow because I'm not in a hurry. And then we say, well, it's not the fast taxi anymore. It's the slow taxi. Uh, so now we get 267 knock for the slow taxi. And we can now, if we wanted to make this mutable, for example, nobody can access the fields of the struct from outside of the struct anymore. So they are all private in the module, uh, but uh, the module can change it. So here, for example, we have access to the, all the fields inside of this module. Of course, this is not mutable, so it, we can't actually change it. But if we wanted to, for some reason, make it mutable and say that for every time we want to say params the rate. Uh, increases by one. So every time you compute the fare, it increases by one. Then you say, oh, it's first time it costs 267 and 273 and 279. Then we can access it within this library even if it's private in the struct. This is part of the same module, so it's public for this module, but not for users. So here I can't change it, but here I can access the members directly and change them. Uh, public in the module. Uh, I could also create functions, of course, to uh, add, you know, modify rates if I absolutely wanted that, but for this purpose, the type, the purpose of the type is, is to uh, 
that. The purpose of the type is just to be a configuration to collect param name parameters in that struct and then pass that to a function. But now we could, if we wanted to, fair parameters dot modify rate minus 25.0 if we absolutely wanted that. Except, uh, what did I do now? Right, because I set mute self instead of reference to mute self, yeah. Because then it would move it into itself and be destroyed. So then this function would actually destroy the object after modifying it and it would be invalid here. So make sure, <laughs> make sure you uh, put the reference there. Uh, anyway, yeah, we actually don't want this. It's just an example. And this should yeah, we're supposed to leave it there. Yeah, uh, cool. So that's all of the visibility rules with parent child uh, modules. We looked at the usage where you can use a folder or a file. Um, we looked at create, we actually created a library create and the next binary create from main. So this is the binary and this is the library. Um, and we created a package which holds the Tomo file like this. Oops. Uh, now we are going to go a little bit further. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do one more thing uh, in here. So it's um, so as you can see, we now currently have yeah we get rid of that. Uh, we have mod taxi and mod fair in here. So this now is part of the executable. But what if we just wanted these modules to be a part of the library and our executable we wanted to be independent, so other people who uh, might want to use our library can also use these other functions. Uh, what we could do then is move these into the library and say, so this library is going to expose, the library creates going to expose the taxi module and the fair, fair uh, one. Uh, that means we will no longer build because we don't know what tax and fare are anymore. I mean, we could do it here as well. But for sake, sake of example, let's just say uh, we want to expose it through our libraries. So we can now say yeah, mod taxi is going to be exposed through the library and fare is going to be exposed through our library crates. Um, that means it now notices that we can import it. So here we can now import taxi and fare. So now we are importing these modules from the library crate into the binary crate. So the library is now the one that sort of hosts them. And we now are just using them from our executable. What this does is it allows us to, if we have other executables, they can also, or other people rely on this library. They can also now use import these modules that are defined elsewhere. And through the, and then, um we just use them so uh using modules and types that's generally fine so we could also be more specific and say we want to use taxi compute fair uh but we're not going to do that because of the issues that we discussed earlier so but now we have access to everything that's the same except now the modules are sort of hosted in the library and exposed so here we could choose to not expose fair uh, which makes that illegal. And instead of using our own base here, we could say that the base equals fair compute fair, and we want the params.distance and params.rate in here instead. So now the library uses this module privately to compute the fair. It exposes a compute fair function to users that does more than just this module's compute fair. We also still change it. I'll leave it there just for example's sake. And then we multiply it by the driving style, which is we expose just in the library. And now fair is not allowed anymore. So let's just comment that out for now. Uh, but now the library one uses it under the hood. So we get that. Uh, any questions about this example so far? Before we move on, I, we just seem to just have time for the cargo stuff as well. 
So after moving the visibility to the library, would it make sense to make the taxi and fare uh, modules private such that people from binaries cannot import them? They are forced to use the library interface then? Uh, you mean make this one private as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Unless somehow taxi uh, had something else in it that would be relevant, but yeah. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, now it, uh, it crashed, I can't type anymore. So just gonna have to restart the ID. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's finish up uh, the rest of the slides. So there's just this thing uh, called uh, conventional configuration, which uh, it's nice to just mention. So what does it mean? It means when we create a project, we don't want to spend our time writing config files just to make something build, unless we have to. Uh, Cargo has some conventions that will help us avoid this if we know how it works. And it's preferable to follow these conventions as other Rust developers will be familiar with it. It's been going to be easier for you as well to look at other people's code that follows the same conventions, and it will save you time from doing configuration. And anyone who's worked with CMake and C++ will know that writing configuration files uh, sometimes is something you would rather not do. So it's, it's nice to be able to do this. Uh, so now we're going to go back to what we looked at in the earlier slide, uh, your package folder. So the convention is you have the cargo lock and the tumble file we already discussed those they are always there otherwise it's not the cargo project that's it going to be recognizable yeah your source folder uh, where we can have lib and main like we just did uh, however there's this case where what if you're writing for example a client and a server program you want more than one executable and you don't want to go in the tumble file and define a heck of a lot of another crates just because um, that means typing and it's boring. So by convention, you can create a bin folder inside the source and every single file you create in here is going to be a new binary executable crate. So if you create this uh, file inside of bin, you're going to get a new target in your build in your target folder that's called name executable. That is an executable. So if we just do that, we can create a rest file. No, sorry. We're going to create a folder called a package here for some reason. We call it bin. And in here, we're going to create a rest file. We're going to call it taxi server. And this one's going to need a main function as well. And we're going to call print uh, hosting taxi server at something like that. Now, if we go cargo run, it's going to be, oh shit, uh, we don't know which binary you want to run because we have the main one and now we have a new one called taxi server. So we can just say bin taxi server. So now we run the taxi server. And if we look at here, we now see we have another executable called taxi server. So you can create as many as you want in this folder. And it's going to create a new executable that you can run. So if taxi ride was a client and taxi server was a server, we can now run taxi ride and taxi server. And uh, uh, they could talk to each other. So when later, when we're going to look at zero MQ, for example, in Rust, then you could create two binaries, like a client and a server, and you can have them in the same package. So you have multiple crates per package. Uh, you can also create a folder in here for multi-file executables. So then this executable is going to be con uh, turned into one executable file with this name. And here you can have main and some other modules if you want, if that makes sense. But generally main, bin, and some other things this should be enough. You can also have a folder called benches where if it benchmarks uh, examples, you can put some examples. And you can use a folder called tests where you can put integration tests. So these are not unit tests. These are integration tests. So this is where you would um, use your library, for example, and use it in a conventional setting. 
and test that it works when you put the entire library together and not just uh, at the unit level where you test each individual uh, function, for example. So, and then these tests can be run as part of the testing procedure. So that's some convention thing. And all of these follow the same pattern. You can create a folder in here with different things if you want multi-file benchmarks, multi-file examples, multi-file tests, and so on. Um, then a couple of useful commands. Uh, build with dash dash release will build an optimized version of your code base. It's going to be much faster than the regular cargo build. Uh, and that's what you want to do when you're going to release something, especially if it's a game or something. Let's just go back here again. So, uh, so now we're in the root folder. We see we have this target thing. That's what cargo creates when you run cargo build. And in here, it's a debug. So if you want to run cargo build release, uh, did I actually not, did I break it? Yeah, I did. There we go. And then we see it's built. And now we inside the target folder, we have debug and release. So we're going to release. We have the same structure. We have the library and the two executables. And we can run them. And it's going to be optimized code. So you're going to get rid of the debug symbols and all of that. It's going to be a lot faster to run. Of course, this program isn't very demanding, so it's not going to be much of a difference. You can run cargo check, which does what, which does the checks to see if your code is would compile, but it's not going to compile it. So we get our warnings. So this is nice if you if you, your project takes like ten seconds to build. You just want to do check and see if you if it would have built, and then you can fix them and then actually build it. So we have a function never used. Uh, that's fine. Uh, cargo update. That's what I talked about in terms of the lock file. So if we look at the cargo lock file, we say that well, it's, there's actually no dependencies here, so it's not very exciting. But if you had version zero point eight of the library. And in the meantime, 0.8.5 came out, you would do cargo update, and then it would update to the latest version based on what you wrote. So this is what you have to do to update it. Uh, cargo fix will fix any uh, issues with your code. For example, if we have unused imports, uh, it will fix that. But you must have a clean Git status for that to work. And I do not, so that's why it doesn't work. It won't fix everything, but it will fix simple things like that. It's going to save you some time if you don't want to look through your unused imports and everything. Cargo FMT uh, is a automatic formatting. Um, the default configuration follows the Rust uh, coding convention, which is uh, an RFC. So it's actually defined somewhere. Uh, but we can do it here. We run cargo FMT. It changes changes things a little bit around. Not much. It actually flipped those guys. Uh, it changed this one to, uh, and it's yeah here it did most the most work actually. It's put everything on separate lines instead of being like that. So if you do that, then you know that you're following the convention. And if everybody does it, then the code's gonna look very similar across the board. Easier to read for most people. Uh, and finally, you have Clippy, which is a linter that is. Uh, a lot more aggressive than cargo check. You have to install both of these, maybe using Rust up component add uh, Rust FMT or Clippy. And then you can just go cargo Clippy. Uh, if I put on all with warnings, yeah, it's only going to say that, yeah, function is never used. Uh, of course, this is a very simple program, so it doesn't have very much to complain about. Uh, in bigger programs, Clippy is going to be very aggressive with you which is a good thing because it helps you write better code. Uh, here's some more reading. If you want to look at uh, this stuff in detail, there's the cargo book and the rust book and the crate index. And I think that's it. Yeah. So unless there are any questions, that should be everything you need to know to get started with this. Um,
So yeah. If there are no final questions, I will finish now. No questions, guys. I I learned a lot. Uh, the, the module subsystem is quite complex. All the parent children rules. Um, yes, it's a. Uh, it took a while to get a hang of it. In the beginning, it was very frustrating. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense. It's uh, logically organized and it's uh, quite powerful for uh, visibility. It's uh, more powerful than like in Go. Yeah. Uh, for example, yeah. It's very right. flexible, but yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. And uh, I will see you next time. All right, thank you very much.